Everybody, it's such an honor and pleasure to invite Eva Khanso to share her living histories with us for this second of two part special edition Living Histories in March 2023. Without further ado, Eva, take it away. Thank you so much, Sri. I'm, it's truly a pleasure to be here. And I have to say, I admire very much what you are doing because after all, we are all human beings first and then scientists next. And this is a way to be able to show who we are as people. And I really appreciate it. And I appreciate this opportunity to be here and telling you about my living history. So my name is Eva Kansu, as, as Sri said, I am a professor at the University of Southern California. And at the time being, I am also a rotator. That means I am a temporary employee, kind of, of the National Science Foundation as a program director. And I'm very happy to be here to tell you a little bit about what I do in both. But before, I just want to start by showing you this um, kind of uh, art done by uh, Nicholas Asker. This, uh, this was basically the idea of USC to do a kind of a um, cartoon of my living history that was published in uh, April 2020, right when the pandemic hit and everyone was locked. So I don't think anyone has seen this, but I think this um, this really represents, summarizes my living history really well. It shows uh, my childhood that I grew up in Beirut. So it shows the war and gray on one side. I grew up in the 80s when Beirut was really in a bad shape in terms of civil war torn by civil war and by a lot of conflict. And right now I am at uh, USC as a professor, as I mentioned, but it also shows this beautiful uh, uh, reproduction of uh, Henri Matisse of his dance picture, which also uh, hints to my um, to the influence of uh, French culture in my life, both growing up in Beirut and also through my personal life, uh, being um, basically uh, being with a half French and living in a half French home. And uh, I love this quote uh, from uh, Antonio Machado about uh, Caminante no hay camino, this is wanderer, there's no road. I love that, and it also hints a little bit about Spanish influence in my life and about this intense period I spent in Spain in my early adulthood. So this basically kind of summarizes my life from childhood to now, and I just want now to tell you a little bit more, um, um, maybe a linear way of how I ended up here at USC from Beirut. So I did my undergraduate degree at the American University of Beirut, I graduated in 1997. That was after the Civil War. This was actually a great time to be in Beirut because there was a lot of hope and excitement and uh, about the end of trouble. And I think I was very fortunate to be part of this period. And I'm showing here an image of the American University of Beirut. You can see the Mediterranean in the back and you can see this beautiful environment. That, uh, that the campus provided. And then I moved directly from Beirut to Berkeley. And that was, um, I mean, it's, it's maybe, it's an understatement to say a culture shock because I had, I had uh, just was transported from one environment to another without knowing the rules that uh, are applicable in the new environment. So I, I my years at Berkeley were, were very, um, I learned a lot, but they were also very difficult. And at Berkeley, I compensated for that difficulty by just gathering a lot of degrees. So I have two degrees and uh, two master's degrees and one uh, PhD. I, I always say the best thing that happened at Berkeley is actually I left it with a PhD. And then I went to Caltech and Caltech was an amazing place. Caltech is actually, I still live in Pasadena. Caltech is next door almost. And I, uh, that's where uh, I started learning truly about science and research and research communities. And that was where that was just an eye opening experience at Caltech. And since then I've been at USC first as an assistant professor, then associate now full professor. And I just want to mention that I did a few uh, visiting positions 
um, all over, both in France and in the United States. And those were very important to me, not to brag about the positions themselves, but because we are who we are by learning from others, by being with others. And being in those environments have helped me a lot to grow both as a person and as a researcher. So in my group at USC, um, I, I, I'm showing this picture. It's a couple of years old. It's a few years old, more than two years, a couple of years old. And it helps that it is an older picture, but it's not that reason that I show it. I show it because I wanted to really show all the people that contributed truly to my lab over the past five years. And uh, I think everyone that I show here has made tremendous contribution both to my lab, but also to me personally. It's one of the most rewarding aspects of what I do in my life is to work with talented people people that are driven, that are smart, intelligent. This is an amazing, it's been an amazing experience for me. And I think beyond the research itself, I'm truly passionate about creating this healthy, diverse and inclusive research environment. And I know I'm not always the, uh, I don't always do the, the everything extremely well by the book, Maybe some of the students would say, oh, sometimes I'm more pushy, sometimes I'm less pushy. But my heart, I think, is always in creating an inclusive and a diverse research community. And that's that's been wonderful. Um, I just, just to give you, because some of you don't know what we do exactly, we work on two types of problems. We work on animal behavior and unstructured environments from an engineering perspective. As I said, I am in an engineer in an engineering department, and we also work on the biophysics of ciliary systems. In both systems, we try to understand the interaction between the morphology, the sensory feedback control, and the physics of the interact of the system and its interaction with the environment. And we are really driven to solve problems. We're not driven driven by a method, by a specific method. My particular training and background is in multi-scale physics, uh, modeling, uh, dynamical systems, perturbation methods, stability analysis. I learned some control, at, at, uh, especially at Caltech. We do computational tech. We use computational techniques. At some point, I was in the field of developing computational methods. Now we mostly use computational methods. And more recently, we went into this entire new, exciting field of data-driven modeling and control. And really what excites me about this is this putting together research teams with diverse backgrounds, technical backgrounds from engineering, biology, physics, and mathematics. So just to give you an idea, just a quick idea about just a quick highlight snippets on three research problems we're working on right now in the lab. We work on ciliary systems. This is a multi-scale problem and we work on mapping structure to function within scales and across scales all the way from subcellular systems and the subcellular structure to organ level organization and function. We work on deciphering the roles of vision and flow sensing in schooling and schooling fish. Here we look both at, we pride ourselves in accounting for the role of, flu, of the fluid dynamics and of the fluid sensing in addition to vision and understanding these transitions between collective dynamic states. And we also work on trying to decode the mechanosensing and feedback control in semi-decentralized distributed nervous systems such as that of the echinoderm shown here. This is a sea star. It moves by the action of hundreds of tube feet. It does that in a very decentralized way. It's a beautiful system to look at. And I just, here is my bragging slide about this work bringing us all the way to BBC News because they were very excited by the bounce of the sea star. But I think there is a common theme in all what we do, which is the following, if I were to articulate it. We know that regulation and corrective actions are important for the autonomous function of both biological and engineered systems in unstructured and unpredictable environments. And the question that we ask in my lab is how much of this regulation relies on active feedback control and how much of it is delegated to the structure itself that has evolved in the structure itself or it, it's embedded in the physics of the structure and its geometry and its, in, and its interaction with the environment. This is if I were to just say 
uh, our common theme in one word. If I have one minute left, I was going to share with you three mistakes that I made in my career, and they are not done. I still make them, and I haven't figured out the solution perfectly yet, but I thought it is maybe important to talk about this, especially in this community. Mistake number one is I expected that my efforts will be seen and that I really felt bad when they weren't. It's as if like you spend an effort to write a paper and then people should know the value of your paper automatically. And that's not how it works. It does not work like that. And the limiting belief here, like if my hard work goes unseen, it means that I'm not good. But that's actually not true. Really, the way to go about this is to be clear on why we work hard, what's the value we get, I get from working hard, how to engage in the world, how to bring attention and the attention of the right people, not the attention of everyone to the work that they should pay attention to. This is all additional effort that needs to be put. It's just kind of like effort does not give you rights. If you do an effort, you have to put more effort to make it seen. And the mistake number two is that I was waiting for others to let me in. And I felt bad when they didn't because none of the problems I mentioned to you now are problems that I learned in my PhD advisor lab or in my postdoc advisor lab. These are problems that we developed, I developed in my career post postdoc. So, uh, so I, it, was, it was a challenge. It was a true challenge. And I had this limiting belief that scientific fields are guarded by gatekeepers and they have to let me in. And that's the way really to go about it in, in science and in research and life is to find what I'm passionate about and find my tribe. And that it's, there is no single tribe. This tribe could change over time. And as my interests change, my tribe would change. So I'm very thrilled to be part of the tribe that this tribe today that's talking about living history. This is not the tribe I grew up with, but this is the tribe that I'm very passionate and very grateful to be part of. The third mistake, and I think this is probably the most important that I made earlier and I still make, is that to completely efface my personal style from my work and to feel unseen and unheard because I used to think that science follows conventions and rules set by others and that I have to follow those rules. And it is true to some extent, there are some guiding principles in science. I think the same way that there are guiding principles in in fashion or in cooking or in whatever, whatever creative endeavor. But really there is, it's absolutely important to develop one's style. It's absolutely important. Um, it's important because at the end of the day, our personal science might change the world, it might not, but it definitely changes us. Our practice definitely changes us as individuals and is an expression of who we are. So for me personally, the road to finding my voice and my tribe has been quite messy at times, but I don't think now looking at it, it's been extremely gratifying and it's extremely enriching. I wouldn't take it any other way. So just to summarize, I think both in my work at USC and NSF, I'm passionate about creating healthy, diverse, inclusive research communities. I'm passionate about working in teams on solving problems and interface of engineering, biology, physics, and applied math. And whenever possible, I work really hard on promoting synergies and alleviating tensions in both between communities, within communities, between the research boundaries and, uh, and, and within a given research field. In my personal life, I'm very grateful for my family, Nicola and our two sons, Stefan and Ziad. I like yoga, I like reading, I like listening to podcasts, especially on philosophy and psychology, and of course, practicing gratitude because this is, this I have always looked at life with extreme excitement and curiosity about how it unfolded and it will continue to unfold. So I want to thank you for listening to me, for giving me this opportunity to share this part of myself, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Eva. What powerful words. In the interest of time, I'm not taking questions, but I do want to express gratitude uh, for the shout out to the Living Histories community. We are so grateful to have you.
Thank you. Thank you.